Hello everyone and welcome to the School of Taste. Welcome back to many of you. Thank you for being with me once more for this, our final session in this webinar series, A Taste of Europe. Um, today we'll be looking at four different Italian uh, red wines. So we will today complete our journey across Europe from Germany where we started down to France, to Spain, and then across to Italy. I think the four major wine producing uh, countries of Europe in terms of both volume and quality of wine produced. Um, so today we're gonna look at four different Italian red varieties. I submit my, not my apologies, but my explanation for not doing Sangiovese and Nebbiolo up front, which is simply that I have discussed these varieties at some length elsewhere in my webinars. Um, if you missed those sessions, then if you go on to the School of Taste website uh, and look up the wine tasting by structure webinars, you'll see that there's one in which I talk about Sangiovese and Nebbiolo um, in some detail. So please do refer to that. So I decided not to do those two very famous and very important varieties today, but instead to look at, I think, four very, very good, uh, even excellent um, varieties in the right hands, uh, but perhaps ones that we don't spend so much time thinking about. So I think, I believe, hopefully worth our time um, to spend a little bit of time on those. And so if you're watching on replay, um, thank you for taking the time to do that. If you're watching live, then as ever, please use the questions function to submit your comments and questions during the course of this live webinar. Okay, so let's get started. Um, Italian reds in general, what can we expect from them? <clears throat> I mean, I think in general terms, if you're um, studying wine, if you're taking wine exams, then Italian reds right off the bat can help you by being um, really built on the twin pillars of acidity and tannin. Uh, if we think about, for instance, Bordeaux or Bordeaux varieties, we can often say that those wines are built on tannin, and that would be a fair description of them. Uh, but it's unusual that you get tannin and acidity together in such a prominent way as you do in Italian reds. Now, of course, not all Italian reds have a lot of tannin, but they have at least some level of tannin. But what they all do have is acidity. Acidity is the benchmark feature of Italian red wines. Um, with one or two exceptions, um, Italian reds have notable levels of acidity. If you think about it, um, when you're drinking red wine, you don't tend to think about acidity unless there's some real reason why you should, usually either because it's very high or very low. Um, and Italian red wines are the one exception where you often find yourself thinking about it coming back to it because the acidity is quite uh, prominent. And that's your first big clue that you might be in Italy. Indigenous Italian varieties tend to retain their acidity very, very well. Um, we'll talk a bit more about tannin during the length of the session. Um, but tannins in general in Italian wines always uh, somewhat grippy, um, grainy, um, have some kind of texture to them. So they're never mellow or silky. They're not Pinot Noir style tannins. They're, they're, they make you realize they're there and they're not, they're not abashed or ashamed um, of themselves. Uh, color, color is a big deal in Italian reds, often because there's simply not a lot of it. Um, that won't be true for all four varieties we look at today, but often you do find that, certainly in the two varieties we're missing out, the Nebbiolo and the Sangiovese, that's true. Um, and so often it, Italian red wines don't have a lot of color. That can be another immediate clue that you might be in Italy. The herbal note, which can take on a variety of different forms, is I think such a key marker for Italian reds and perhaps the one much more than the previous two points I just made that goes unremarked on. You guys know I'm not a big uh, flavor person, but I think the herbal note is so consistent across Italian red wines, it's hard to ignore. Um, it can come in a variety of different guises from anything from the kind of uh, tarragon and anise spectrum towards something vaguely rosemary or sage or all sorts of different things. So just look out for that when you're tasting the wines today. Um, I often talk about these components of wine that help 
to balance out the sweetness of the fruit or the ripeness of fruit. And the herbal note um, in Italian wines is certainly one of those drier aspects of the wine. The volatile acidity in Italian red wines, um, a slightly complicated subject, but at heart, um, the volatile acidity is that aroma of nail varnish remover that you get um, on the nose of many Italian red wines. Usually those which have been aged in somewhat oxidative environments, such as um, oak, especially large oak or old oak, especially for an extended period of time. Um, a combination of high levels of acidity and a slightly oxidative environment can give that very high toned nail varnish, nail polish remover aroma. Can have a positive element though, because it can also help lift the aromatics, make them almost float out of the glass a little bit more, enhance the aromatic um, effect of Italian reds. Talking about the way that the wines are raised, um, not, you know, there are many wineries since the turn of the century who have used um, French oak, small French oak. Um, but in general terms, I think we're seeing a movement away from that since about 2010 or 2011. Um, I think in general, Italian wines do not want to be marked by oak. Um, older or larger uh, oak is usually the order of the day when it comes to Italian red wines. Um, some wines, maybe super Tuscans, things like that. Yep, sure, I'm still gonna see some oak. But in general, the classic regions of origin, the classic varieties, um, producers tend to want to allow themselves to express themselves very clearly rather than having any influence of oak. On the other hand, not much stainless steel. They don't want these chiseled, perfect, perfectly fruity wines. Something about the slightly oxidative effect of aging in oak, the softening of the edges, perhaps just a little tiny touch of um, oxidative notes can be welcomed, I think, in many occasions by, uh, by Italian winemakers. The sour red cherry note is just something which is so consistent across Italian reds. See whether we get it in uh, any or all of the wines we have today. Again, difficult not to remark on when it's so common. Um, very consistent. Maybe the only place where it wouldn't be would be in the very warm south. So think about that when perhaps we get to the Sicilian wine. Um, yeah, and you know, I guess summing up, quintessential European reds in the sense that these are basically savory dry wines a whole range of climates from you know the north of italy and the alps to all the way down to sicily and the mediterranean um, but ultimately these are dry european red wines with dry finishes um, very quintessential european wines in that respect okay so um, time to start tasting. Um, first wine, I mean, very broadly, you can see, I don't think I need to tell you, just look up the lineup of wines I suggested. I'm really looking to work from north to south in Italy today. So um, I thought we'd start with um, a Piemontese variety in the form of Barbera. So please pour your Barbera if you have one. And I've been enjoying what we've been doing in previous weeks where um, I make you guys do a little bit of work, but I hope you find it uh, useful and interesting to you um just to try and write a sentence or two for me to sum up the style of the wine or the points of interest about the wine what you note about it what jumps out the glass um whether that's it's an aromatic variety or not the body any notes on wine making that are obvious to you um what are the characteristics of the variety that emerge most clearly to you from from the glass um is it a fruity wine or a dry wine? Is the acidity or the tannin or the alcohol particularly noticeable? All those kind of things. So please tell me what is uh, obvious to you in just one or two sentences. And as, as ever, please do tell me which wine you're tasting, just so I have some, some context for that. Uh, Barbera, um, I decided not to do the maps this time because um, some of these varieties can be grown in numerous different places. In previous sessions, we've been looking at individual regions. Here we're more looking at varieties and they can be grown in different places. So, um, but generally, of course, uh, Piedmont for Barbera. So Alba, Barbera d'Alba. Alba is the town of uh, the sort of Barolo Barbaresco region. If you need to do any, you know, shopping, you go to Alba. So, I mean, the Barbera district is right there, right next to the great appellations of Barbera. 
uh, of Barolo, excuse me, and Barbaresco. Uh, Barbara Dasti is just a little bit to the northeast um, of the town of Asti. I don't know whether I want to put a mileage on it, maybe 20 miles away from Albert to the northeast. So not far. Um, and um, this is really the homeland, I think, for top quality Barbera. I think um, I do generally perceive a little bit of confusion about the identity of Barbera um, among wine students. I think um, there's a, a sort of perception that it's a little bit, it could easily be confused with Dolcetto, um, that it's a sort of innocuous, fruity, juicy wine um, about which nothing more needs to be said, really. Um, that it doesn't really have much sort of great ambition beyond just being that. Um, I don't think that's quite right anymore. I think there is plenty of that. Um, but I think there are many other things um, that Barbera is capable of. So I'll be interested to see what you guys say about your example. Um, but I would say that in general, I mean, the very fact that you can buy these wines, Barbera, for, you know, $75 if you want to, implies to me that it's not a simple everyday variety. I suppose like every other wine producing region in the world, but it seems especially accentuated in Italy, the yields that you're working with um, and the winemaking and things like that can seem to influence the quality of these varieties so considerably. So can you buy Barbera for $12 or $15 or euros or less? Sure. Um, and is it a light to medium bodied, simple fruity wine? Yes, sure, I don't deny that. Um, but I don't know whether those kind of wines are capturing the full potential of the variety. Um, yeah, I mean, that point I think about is somehow the watering down of these varieties. Maybe it's accentuated by the high acidity in Italian reds. So that if you get a um, wine of limited fruit because it's been overcropped, the yields are too high, then you get left with just a whole bunch of acidity and not much fruit concentration, not much body to the wine. So, yeah, that's a tough combination to work with. But lower yields are going to increase the concentration of fruit um, and going to integrate the acidity better and likely also you're going to have more tannin, um, more building blocks um, in terms of structure for the wine. Okay, any comments about your Barbera, whether it comes from Alba or Asti or anywhere else? I mean, of course, it is grown in the Barolo and Barbaresco region as well, you know, usually planted on the lesser slopes, not the perfect, you know, south or west facing slopes, maybe the cooler sites because it's harvested before Nebbiolo, right? So um, the wine can be processed in the cellar before the Nebbiolo is ready, which is extremely convenient for the wine producers. Uh, okay, two feet, thank you. 13% um, alcohol, moderate intensity of ripe red fruit, uh, spice and herbal hints, good. High juicy mouth-watering acidity. So high acidity, interesting, good point medium levels of soft tannins and a medium body and length with a savory finish which is also dry yeah so note the emphasis here on high acidity and moderate tannins and moderate everything else um but with a dry finish um good uh red fruit by the way toothy um sarah um dusty dry cranberry sour red cherry um, high acid, so just like Tufi, high acid, 14.5% alcohol compared to Tufi's 13%. Big difference, isn't there, between 13 and 14.5, same region, same variety. Um, moderate fruit concentration and moderate tannins. Okay, so emphasis again on moderation in all things for Sarah. I, I kind of picking up on some of the points that Tufi made. Um, Jennifer, uh, lots of bright cherry fruit and spice, medium plus acidity, medium body, and medium grainy tannins. Good. Amiel, uh, bright red cherries and currants, 
uh, cigar box. Good, sounds nice. Finely grained medium plus tannins, which are almost ripe. Okay, interesting note. Dry cherries, sage, high acidity and a complex long finish. Okay, very good. So uh, the points I take away from that, I think, are the moderate plus tannins and the high acidity. Um, but it sounds like a nice long finish there, which is good. Um, that was a 2013, so maybe developed a little bit of complexity with age. Uh, Corin, um, spice and cinnamon, red cherry, dusty earth undertones, high mouthwashing acidity, low but low soft tannins. Interesting, so an example of low tannins there. Medium body, 14.5% alcohol, yeah, but seems lower. Um, Michelle also has got 14.5% juicy red berries, dried herbs, so again, the herbal note recurrent, soft, well-integrated, chalky tannins, crisp acidity, eminently drinkable. Good. Moderate, dry and savory finish. Very good. Uh, Nupa, uh, bright red cherry, earthy with vibrant acidity and dusty tannins, medium bodied. Good. Uh, sunny, uh, medium plus intensity of sour red cherry, strawberry plum, sage, good herbal note, cinnamon and nutmeg, um medium plus acid moderate body and alcohol moderate plus tannins and finish savory very good and still juicy despite being from the cool 2012 vintage good good note sunny um alice uh red fruit cherries plums and a little hint of volatile acidity more herbal and savory on the palate uh good high acidity but moderate everything else uh, a lot of emphasis here on moderate, moderate tannins, moderate body. Um, sometimes the alcohol is slipping up there. The two things that stick out to me about these notes are the alcohol. Not always, but we have seen some 14, some 14 and a half, uh, high acidities as well. Um, but no one going overboard with the tannins here, just sort of moderate tannins. Shengli, uh, deep brooding leather, balsamic oil. So balsamic to me is a VA note, a volatile acidity note, balsamic. Uh, many Italian red wines taste of balsamic, which I think is just another way of saying that many Italian red wines have got at least a, a little volatile acidity. Because if you leave wine not topped up in the barrel, if you take the stopper out, just leave it, what's it going to turn into? It's going to turn into vinegar. So go figure. Herbs, game, baking spices, mushroom, dark cherry, blackberry. Good. So sounds like a nice complex example there. Uh, good notes. Let's see what I came up with. I think you pretty much ticked off all my all my points uh, you make my life very easy for me a uh, color we didn't really note the color um but my one at least has got quite a good color um i would say deep ruby i don't think i can see through it um has anyone got anything deeper than that anyone got a purple example occasionally in very young barbarians you get purple almost electric purple but mine's actually ruby kind of deep ruby but quite a concentrated color so Barbera would certainly be one of those Italian varieties that does not fit the mold of being light in color, like its neighbor in this region, Nebbiola. Medium, occasionally full body. Yeah, so it doesn't seem like anyone had the full bodied examples today, but occasionally in these warm vintages, like for instance, uh, 17, 2017 hot vintage, you can get a whole mouthful of fruit and quite structured, powerful tannins which combine to make a full bodied wine. Um, so that the medium, yep, uh, makes perfect sense. Brambly black fruit. So <laughs> uh, I remember that this time last year, I was, I was having this thought when I was in uh, the region, I was in Piedmont and every single winery you go to, you know, you taste the Dolcetto, you taste the Barbera, uh, then you taste the Lange Nebbiolo, and then you taste the Barolo or the Barbaresco. And I realized at that point that every single one of these wines across these different varieties has got this kind of brambly uh, blackberry note to it. I think it's so redolent of the region, but Barbera perhaps more than any of the others, um, uh, a kind of brambly fruit quality to it. Uh, rich but fresh, rich in terms of uh, the fruit. Um, there's plenty of ample juicy fruit, um, but that's very nicely balanced out by, as all of you guys have said, the typical Italian high acidity. Um, moderate tannins, I think you guys all said that. 
Uh, I think it depends. Um, I think it's one of those varieties where many factors affect the texture of those tannins. Um, some people go more on the velvety side of this equation, but others more on perhaps the slightly grainier, almost chalky, chalky side. I think all of those are fine. Um, crunchy fruit. What do I mean by crunchy fruit? Um, <laughs> difficult one to describe, but almost like fruit you can get your teeth into. Um, it's not soft and voluptuous, Rubens-esque. No, it's not like that. It's it's quite chiselled, uh, and yes, it's juicy, but it's also you can almost crunch down on it with your teeth. Um, kind of funny sensation with Barbera. And then the alcohol we already talked about a bit, moderate to high, fourteen point. I think fourteen, fourteen is high to me. So fourteen plus is high. Um, we can have a competition if you like about who's seen the highest alcohol Barbera. But if you haven't inspected the back label of your Barbera recently then you're going to be shocked to see how these alcohols in Barbera, particularly from the Barolo and Barbaresco zones, have been going up in recent vintages. 14% um, almost to me is now minimum from these warmer areas like that. 14 and a half is standard. I've seen 15, I've seen 15.5. I've seen 16. So proceed with caution when you're drinking your Barbera on a Friday night. Uh, Amber, uh, 2018 Barbera, 14.5%. Uh, um, throwaway line, throwaway line, which will date this podcast, this uh, webinar, excuse me, for when you're watching on recording. We, we record this in November, December 2020. At this time, um, there are uh, still tariffs on some Italian wines which are entering the US. And the tariff line is any wine that has got less than 14% alcohol. If you've got more than 14% alcohol, you're fine. You don't have to pay the tariff. Um, so there could be some incentive for wine producers to put 14.5% on the label. Just saying, it could be. Um, Amber, 2018 Barbera, 14.5%. Amber saying you can definitely feel the heat. So it's not just on the label in that example, it's really there. A mix of red and black fruit, cherry and plums, lots of spice, cinnamon and anise. Yes, I love the anise call on, um, on here. Does anyone else get anise? I think anise is a statement about ripeness. You get anise in many wines, but almost always uh, associated with quite high ripeness. Maybe high alcohol and anise notes go together. I certainly get that almost like a tarragon anise kind of note. Uh, medium tannins, but very dusty. So dusty, chalky, I think we're in the same world. Deep ruby color um, and a little staining. Yeah, so uh, Amber picking up on the deep color of the wines. Um, confusions, what do you guys think you could confuse Barbera with? I didn't, you know, nothing really immediately sprung to mind. Um, so I'm gonna leave that one open to you. Catherine asking, what are the major differences between Alba and Asti when it comes to Barbera? Is it just quality? Well, it is true that Asti is a DOCG and Alba is only a DOC. Um, so that could uh, that could indicate that they believe that there's high quality in Asti. Um, certainly from the sub the Nizza, N-I-Z-Z-A, Nizza subzone of Asti, that's a very premium location for Barbera. Um, so yeah, I think uh, I think it's I think it's quality, I don't think anyone's ever going to ask you to distinguish between those two. I think if you're sitting in a wine exam and you thought you got a Barbera, I think you would just say Barbera d'Alba or Barbera d'Asti. I think I'd be totally fine. Um, Sarah saying, could you confuse uh, Barbera with a Southern Rhone blend? Um, fruit, so you get the fruit, yes. The high alcohol, yes. The moderate tannins, yes. And the herbal notes, yeah. Um, acidity. I guess is what's going to take you away because in those Southern Rome blends, almost always the uh, Grenache is going to be predominant. So that's going to take away the acidity. Um, and I, I hate to say this, but it's a slightly different herbal quality. It, it, this isn't, I don't think in Barbera it's the Garig herbal quality. You know, you can almost see the lavender fields of Provence when you taste the Garig herb quality in those Southern Rome blends. It's not quite that herbal quality. It's a bit, uh, fresher somehow, not quite dried in that way. Um, and a bit more structured as well. 
the the architecture of a typical Italian wine. I know the Italians aren't crazy on Barbera, but they've got at least some firm structure to them in a way that sometimes we can lack in those Southern Rhone ones where the generosity of the fruit can often win out. Um, Amber, I can see myself confusing this for a Primitivo from Puglia. Um, I think Primitivo, so I do think that, you know, in spite of the high alcohol that we were just talking about, there is a sort of northern kind of clipped quality to the fruit. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about crunchy, that the fruit is quite precise, you know, um, the acidity outlines the fruit, so it never feels like it's sort of breaking its boundaries and becoming voluptuous and soft and decadent. All of those things are much more southern where the ripeness is, is greater. And I think, I don't know whether you've ever done that tasting side by side, Amber, I don't think I have, but if I would do, I would expect that the southern wine just have so much greater ripeness and without the finely delineated boundaries between acid and tannin and fruit, everything might just sort of overflow its boundaries and um, just a very rich whole. Tufi, Barbera, Grignolino and Frasier. Tufi, I mean, just give up. I mean, if you get that tasting, then I think the examiners are feeling very, very angry if they give you that tasting. They're having a bad day at the office if they think that that's a fair thing to do. Grignolino and Frasier are, for those of you who don't know, uh, minor supporting varieties in this region, um, grown occasionally else, elsewhere as well, but very, very rarely seen um, on the international markets. Um, some producers make a specialty of them, and certainly if you're a, a som in a cool wine bar, then you think these things are the greatest things ever. Um, normal humanity does not see those wines, so it's very unlikely, I think, in a wine exam you're going to be asked about them. Um, but I think Barbera would have a bit more concentration than either of those. Um, Corin saying Primitivo always tastes like cooked or stewed dark fruit to me. Exactly. Ripeness, ripeness, ripeness. Um, Sunny, other reds, Brunello, Alianico. So well, let's talk about the Alianico, Alianico confusion when we get to that. Um, Brunello, Sangiovese, uh, those sandy tannins, I think you're looking for in Sangiovese. Um, and much powerful, more powerful tannin structure, much more powerful tannin structure. Um, high everything, high concentration, high intensity of flavor, high alcohol, high tannin, high acidity, long aging in oak, four years, you know, two years in oak, two years in bottle prior to release, um, gives the impression of a mature wine, even when the wine is uh, released. Barbaric option is a pretty, pretty fruity wine right away. Okay, I am conscious of the time. We do need to get some uh, more wines uh, tasted today so we don't run out of time. So um, let's move on to the next wine, Montepulciano. Um, so please pour that, taste that. Do for me the same thing as you've just done for um, uh, for Barbera. Talk a little bit about the overall style of the wine. Um, and again, tell me what uh, wine you're drinking. Um, and Corin, uh, who knows uh, Piedmontese varieties better than I do, says Grignolino and Frege will have much bigger and more powerful tannins. So maybe they would be better confused with Nebbiolo, do you think, Corin? Um, Trufi, uh, basic Valpolicella, not basic. Not basic. I think this has got more going on than basic Valpolicella, uh, which can be quite a simple fruity wine. Here, I think, you know, those kind of chalky tannins and the elevated acidity and like what I'm calling that crunchy quality, the, the way that everything is quite well defined in the wine, um, the acidity of the tannins, the fruit. I don't think you really get that in Valpolicella where the tannins are, are very low um, uh, in comparison to this, I think. Um, the acidity doesn't feel as high, um, just a bit of a softer, easygoing wine all round. Barbera is a juicy, pleasant wine to drink, but Valpolicella, really, you can drink most normale Valpolicella, not, you know, not all the, not the Amarone, not the Rapasso, but you can drink most normale Valpolicella without thinking too much about it. Barbera, I think you realize you're in the presence of something, for sure. Um, okay, I'll taste your uh, Montepulciano. Um, well, you're doing that. I will just taste.
there's an overall, I would just say some of the Barbera then, there's an overall sense of northern moderation and balance in most Barberas. In the same, and you know, you can just taste the way that we're in the same land here as Nebbiolo. Nebbiolo is a weird variety for all the reasons that we know. It doesn't seem like there's that much fruit, but there's a lot of tan and a lot of acidity. Um, but for those reasons, the lack of the abundant fruits, we have a lot of skeleton, if you want to put it like that. We have a lot of skeleton in Nebbiolo. Um, and even if we don't have that much fruit, that much flesh, we've got a bit more flesh here. But you still get a pretty strong skeleton in Barbera. Um, I think wines like Valpolicella or then those southern Italian reds, the skeleton recedes into the background and you just get the flesh a bit more. Um, there's something quite precise about Barbera that even Dolcetto would lack, I think. Dolcetto, by the way, we didn't mention, I don't really think it's a, a confusion because it's quite a different style of wine, but Dolcetto, of course, is famous for having one of the only Italian varieties not to have that much acidity. So moderate at most. And the lack of acidity could be, although this is disputed, could be what gives the wine its name. Dolce, do, dolce, dolce sweet, because you've got no sour acidity, so it feels a little sweet, a little sweet one, dolcetto. Um, so it could be that, um, but dolcetto really doesn't have much in the way of tannin usually, less tannin than Barbera, less acidity than Barbera, less fruit than Barbera, um, a much easier, easy going wine. Um, the other day I was making a comment on, um, on Twitter that, you know, many people say, oh, you can't, uh, you should never drink Italian red wines by themselves because they're so much better with food, et cetera, et cetera. Well, because I do these kind of sessions so often, and many of them are about Italian wine, I have a lot of Italian red wine at home and I have to find a way of drinking it somehow. A glass over dinner is not gonna get through it all. So sometimes I drink them before dinner as well. And I was making the comment on Twitter that if I'm going to drink a red wine before dinner, then often I'll go for an Italian red wine because of the acidity. It really, you know, if you're not gonna have a white, then the acidity is as close as you can get from an Italian red to, to having a white. Um, and I've got some interesting comments, <laughs> as you always do. Um, but someone said, oh no, of course, of course you're right, Nick, you should drink Dolcetto. And I thought it completely missed the point because Dolcetto is the one variety that doesn't have that much acidity. I would like to drink simple Sangiovese, simple Valpolicella, Barbera, these kind of wines before dinner because um, they're delicious and they've got that crunchy acidity, uh, which I think is exactly what you need as you prepare your, your palate to, to drink. Okay, anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted here. Montepulciano d'Abruzzo or Montepulciano from elsewhere, but Montepulciano d'Abruzzo is the most important, uh, I think, DOC for this wine. Montepulciano d'Abruzzo, so in Abruzzo, in the Marche, uh, on the Adriatic coast, the Adriatico on the other side of uh, the peninsula from Tuscany. Very earthquake prone, by the way, when you go there. Um, Montepulciano, not to be confused with Vino Nobile di Montepulciano, which is Sangiovese, as you know. Um, what are the characteristics that you're getting from Montepulciano? I, the reason why I included it in this session is that I do think that it's a great value Italian red wine. I think it's one that no one ever, ever discusses. I think people think it's just insipid, simple, fruity wine, like I was saying about the old fashions, understanding of Barbera. But I think it's capable of much more than that. I had a problem with this wine that I also had, uh, you might remember me saying with the uh, Humia that we tasted when we were in Spain last time, I wanted to spend, you know, $20 or $25 to get a good example, a uh, sort of more ambitious, interesting example, but it was tough to find uh, Montepulciano d'Abruzzo at that price, which is a pity, um, because I know that there are excellent producers out there. Anyway, let's see what uh, Amiel says. Um, Amiel has a Reserva from 2015. Very ripe uh, blackberries and blueberries, figs and dates. Um, wow, so it sounds like quite a ripe example, Amiel. Um, roasted hazelnut, nutty quality are good, I like that. Rosemary, uh, dry grass, salt, high alcohol, medium plus acidity, overall unpleasant finish due to the high salinity. Wow, so that sounds like a very strange wine, Amiel. Um, I hope apart from the finish, nonetheless, it's enjoyable. Uh, some takeaway points for me there. 
quick, I mean, complexity, but it sounds like a lot of ripeness. Maybe that's reserva speaking. Um, a high alcohol, uh, medium plus acidity, not high like we were in the Barbera. Um, sunny, uh, deep ruby, uh, medium intensity, dark black cherry, plums, chalk dust. Good, I like that. Forest floor, savory, medium plus tannins, uh, which are dusty and felt on the gums. Medium plus acidity, moderate finish. Overall, less juicy and leaner and more structure than Barbera. Good, good notes, good comparison. Alice, moderate purple color. Yeah, my one has also got a purple color, a really quite a deep color, um, which might be the first thing, by the way, that makes me think this isn't what I just described, an insipid light red, deep color. Alice, bramble fruit, dark cherry, sweet spice on the nose, sweet fruit on the palate. High acidity, rather separate from the fruit, soft, powdery, tannin, lacks some body. Okay, so quite a lot going on, but perhaps not enough body um, to have a completely balanced wine. Um, Sarah, uh, moderate color, quite earthy tobacco. So again, an emphasis on the savory components of the wine, not just um, the fruit. Uh, medium plus grainy, slightly rustic tannins. Medium fruit intensity, quite high acid. Uh, moderate finish. Uh, savory, refreshing. Again, emphasis on savory, um, but good acidity. Um, a lot of moderates, again, a bit like the, the Barbera. Amber, 13%. Uh, anyone else noticeable alcohol? 13% um, I don't think would be unusual. A bit lower here, I would say, in general terms as a variety than Barbera. Um, very bright red fruit with a pretty almost ethereal rose-like nose of cherry, raspberries, and strawberries. So interesting that Amber's very squarely in the red fruit territory, whereas we had other people who were in the black or even blue fruit territory. The palate, and the palate shakes those rose thoughts with ripe but grippy medium plus tannins and only medium acidity. Overall, very pleasant, if simple. Okay, and so very similar notes actually, I think to what Sarah was saying. Um, moderate tannins, slightly dusty or chalky uh, and acidity, good. Philip, Reserva. Purple color, really ripe fruit, uh, accenting plum, high acid, medium plus to high tannins. So a lot going on here uh, in Philip's example, high alcohol, high acid, medium plus to high tannins. Uh, dusty tannins on the finish. Um, the plum uh, is fruit forward and ripe, but the tannins almost overwhelm. So a lot of tannins in Philip's example, it's interesting. Toofy, 13% deep color, ripe black fruit, hints of dust, juicy acidity, moderate levels of tannin, felt mostly on the gums and on the tongue, medium body and length, ends both with fleshy fruit and dryness. Um, good. So again, the, both the tannins and the finish can be quite dry in this way. Good, I think that's good, a good comment. Uh, Michelle, uh, 2013, uh, ripe black fruit, super savory and meaty bay leaves, moderate plus tannins, velvety, refreshing acidity, uh, moderate mid palate concentration. So again, that's quite a, becoming quite a consistent note that we haven't got blockbuster fruit in the middle of this wine. It's not that concentrated, not that powerful, uh, and a moderate finish, good. And Jennifer, 13% uh, medium purple color, uh, medium intensity, ripe red and black fruits, red plum, black cherry, sweet spice, moderate acidity, alcohol, and low tannin. So we're all over the place with the tannin, everything from low to high, uh, soft, plush, juicy. Uh, Corin, uh, medium ruby, plum, bramble, sweet spice, tobacco, mint. Um, so again, savory and sweeter elements there. Moderate plus acidity, grainy tannins in the moderate body, 13 and a half alcohol, good. Nupa, uh, red and black, spicy balsamic notes, Fresh, moderate acidity, firm, coarse tannins, savory dry finish. Um, good. Shengli is um, uh, is our savior because he's not he's the only one who's not in Montepulciano Chano Debrut, so he's in Rosso Piceno, which is cool. Uh, Seventy percent Montepulciano, Chano, thirty percent Sangiovese. Deep ruby, slightly purple, jammy blackberry prune, licorice, tar, and ash. 
elevated acidity, dusty, medium uh, tannin, I think you mean 13.5% alcohol and a moderate finish. Good. Um, wow, super interesting, huh? I mean, it's just interesting to canvas a whole variety of opinions um, and tasting notes from everyone's got different examples, but same variety. We see a lot of consistent things. Um, let me just move forward to what I thought. Um, but before I look at what I said, just to sum up what you guys said, I think very, very general, um, deep color, moderate alcohol, 13%, 13 and a half, some reserve as well higher. Um, lots of red fruit, but some black fruit as well. Um, but an emphasis on an overall kind of savory quality, which comes from the tannins, which can be a bit dry. Some people said words like rustic or even coarse. Um, uh, a dry finish, very, very consistent, um, which might go hand in hand with a herbal quality. Um, uh, and perhaps an overall sense um, of a slight lack of generosity in the middle of the wine, in the mid palate. Maybe Barbera might have a bit more fruit, a bit more density there. Um, so let's just see what I came up with. Quite a deep color. Medium bodied, I think, was pretty much the general consensus. I'm going with moderate, firm, chalky tannins. Firm, I think, is a is a nice word. It kind of covers a multitude of sins. Um, it means that the tannins, I think, are quite unyielding. They're not going anywhere. You never stop noticing them. They're they're firm. Uh, whatever else you know, we can say about the texture. Fruity and juicy. Um, yes, but balanced by the acidity and the dry finish. Um, perhaps I should have put in there, maybe the only thing missing from this slide is the emphasis on some savory quality. All of you picked up, I think, on some kind of savory note, whether that's herbal or spice, uh, something dusty, someone said smoky, these kind of, these kind of notes. Um, and again, we're piling up these things. I mean, only really since I started doing these sessions have I really thought in these terms, but, um, you know, we keep on coming across this subject of, you know, the warming climates we have in all wine regions across the world, but in red wines, you know, what that can mean is higher fruit concentrations and riper fruit, uh, maybe richer and riper fruit. And so what elements of the wine are going to balance those aspects out? And what I call the dry elements of the wine are tannin, always has got a dry quality, obviously, acidity, um, not just for being refreshing, but also being on the dry side of things as well. That would be sour, sour being on the dry side of things. Herbal quality, a herbal or a spicy quality, uh, something like that, which I don't think is minerality. I don't think it is. I think that's just a flavor. Um, and then if you do get any, any minerality as well, uh, I'm not a huge person for minerality in red wine, um, but if, if you are and you get that, that would also be a dry component. And all of these elements can knit together on the finish, which is behind perhaps why Italian red wines, which can feature all those four things, can be quite dry on the finish compared to what they are up front. We've talked about the way in connection with Italian white wines, that the story of the wine is often felt on the finish rather than on the front of the wine. Maybe all the way that the different elements come together on the finish of the red wines is also something which is very useful to listen to. Um, okay, so let me just think for a second about other things that we could um, confuse this wine with. I don't know what your thoughts are. Um, just going back to the confusion between Barbera and Dolcetto, which I was arguing isn't really that much of a confusion. Alice kindly has just done the work for us. Alice says, I just poured a Dolcetto to compare with the Barbera. It's a totally different wine, almost blue fruit uh, in the Dolcetto, yeah, and much lower acidity. That's the key to Dolcetto, much lower acidity. Um, okay, so Tufi's asking Nero Davola. Um, so Nero Davola to me is um, a slightly less what I call well behaved wine. Than, um, than this. Montepulciano is, I think, for all the reasons you just described, a sort of quintessential Italian red. Um, it's dry and it's a bit dusty. It's got firm tannins, high acidity, a moderate body with mostly red, but some dark fruits. I mean, you're describing quintessential Italian wine. And yes, we can talk about the herbal elements, the spice element, but basically 
we're in sort of quintessential Italian world, which is why on the slide, those confusions I've listed could also fit that description of quintessential Italian red, because all those things I just said can apply to Barbera, to Chianti, to Valpolicella within reason. But I don't think they can all apply to Nero, Nero Davola being a less well-behaved Italian red, a bit wilder, a bit more untamed, a bit more savory, meaty, earthy, um, a bit more funky, uh, aromatically. Um, tannins a little less sophisticated, not sophisticated, but polished. They're not as polished. They can be quite powerful and a bit rustic and coarse. And yes, I agree they can be here, but because I believe there's more of them in Nero, you notice them more. Um, we can talk about the um, Etna varieties when we get to Norello, but basically my sort of bias, my prejudice is that Norello is the superior variety to Nero because it's more polished. I don't think that Nero is a very polished variety. I think those tannins are quite rugged and a bit harsh and serious. Um, and I think the level of those is really gonna take you away from Montepulciano and to somewhere further. And the kind of savage wild quality, the meaty quality might be a bit further, a bit further south from here um, in central Italy. Um, Michelle saying that she's got Brett in her uh, wine. And of course, Brett is always a, a bit of a risk in, um, in Italian reds. Um, I think it's a question about barrel hygiene. You've got some pretty traditional style winemaking going on across Italy. And of course, many, many producers have no problems with it, but it's still common among many Italian red wines. And in fact, if we're talking about the generally savory quality of Italian red wines, Brett, um, that sort of, how to describe it, sort of slightly dirty, dirty, sweaty, leathery, meaty aroma and flavor, maybe that goes quite well with Italian red wines. So many of you will not see that as um, too much of an issue. Um, um, Corin saying Montepulciano has asynchronous maturation, which I think translated means the berries within the same bunch, some mature faster than others do. So you get some which are small and not very ripe and you get others which are, are riper and bigger. So you can get overripe plus underripe green notes in it. Um, that's a great uh, piece of information. Thank you, Corin. Very, really interesting. Um, Zinfandel would be another variety, which of course is another Italian variety, um, which has suffers from the same thing, underripe and overripe berries within the same bunch. Um, interesting. Um, uh, the pips also ripen uh, very slowly, um, which can contribute to un underripeness sometimes. So that would contribute to harsh tannins and high acidity. Um, Barbera, we've just, I think you can see for yourself what the, uh, whether you think it's like Bar Barbera. I think we're going, as we go a bit further south, we've got a bit bit more softness here, perhaps to the fruit and uh, moving away from that crunchy fruit, more towards the middle, uh, sort of middle part of Italy, just a bit rounder, uh, a roundness to the fruit and to the tannins perhaps. The Sangiovese, the Chianti, not Brunello, of course, we're not in a wine of that scale of something like Brunello or even Chianti Reserva, but a regular Chianti, I could confuse it, Apart from the color, I mean, the color, we're worlds apart, aren't we? Um, and Chianti, just look for the real sandiness of the Sangiovese. Valpolicella, again, probably lacks the tannins that we have here. Um, and it's a very red wine in color, I mean, not this purple color. Okay, keep on giving me your thoughts, but I do want to run on to the next wine so we don't get behind. Uh, we are continuing our journey southward, so if you manage to find an Alianico del Vulture or a Taurasi from the Alianico variety, now would be the time to pour it. Um, many of you know that uh, this is actually a favorite of mine, Alianico. I think it's a super interesting complex variety which we never discuss, which I think we should be discussing in the same uh, conversation as Nebbiolo and Sangiovese as being among the, the great Italian red varieties. Um, I suppose we're limited perhaps by quite small producing regions, um, but I think it is a really, a really cool variety. I hope you've uh, experienced it before. Um, 
look out a little bit for some of those descriptions I gave about Nero Davila uh, just a few a few moments ago, um, and think about that when I when you're tasting the uh, Alianico. What I was talking about in Nero Davila is the slightly what I call un, untamed uh, quality of Nero being quite a kind of wild wine with slightly funky um, aromatics, um, taste profile being quite savory. Um, think about that when you're tasting this wine. Um, and then think also about the way, you know, everyone will have heard the famous description of Alianico being um, the Nebbiolo of the South. Uh, think about that. Do you think that that is a fair description? Um, is it accurate? Is it relevant? Does it help us understand the wine at all? Um, what leaps out of the glass to you here? So, um, Tarasi, uh, Alianico del Vulture, Campania Basilicata, so Naples uh, and South. Um, so, we're sort of getting now, I think we can call this a, a southern. Italian wine, a southern Italian variety, which needs a lot of ripeness, a lot of sun to ripen successfully. And certainly, like so many other Italian varieties, if you have a, a cooler year, then it's it's tough. It can be. Um, but when it does get the, the warmth, it can produce, I think, very, very complex wines. I hope you managed to find one. Um, I think this is certainly one of those wines which we were just talking about in the context of Brett, unfortunately, I, I find so many examples of this wine, of this style of wine with uh, with a bit of Brett, with a bit of that earthy meatiness, which may be a characteristic of the variety, but when you feel it as abundantly as you do sometimes, you just know it, it's it's Brett, it's not the variety, and it seems to be unfortunately common with Alianico, which is too bad. Um, um, but then I think, you know, we really, the best way of understanding the wine, I mean, the closest you might be to a wine that comes from a bit further north to it would be certainly, I think, a Brunello in terms of the scale of the wine, uh, the ambition of the wine. But otherwise, I'm looking further south. I'm looking more towards the Etna varieties of Nero Davola and Norella Mascalese, and perhaps also to those ones like Primitivo, um, um, Negro Amaro, down there from the very southern part of Italy. I think that is the sort of intellectual space that you might be in when you're thinking about, about this wine. Also interesting to think, by the way, about whether there's any international varieties or other varieties from outside Italy that might be similar in some respects to Alianico. Outside of Italy, the obvious one to me would, would be Zinamavro um, from northern Greece. Um, Zinamavro, I am always thinking about this, the funky aromatics, quite interesting aromas from that variety. Powerful tannins. It, the, the, those tannins can be tamed in that variety um, through careful winemaking. And you know how much you want to extract. You can get many examples of that wine for $12 or $15, which is hard to find Alianico for that price. And those cheaper examples of Zinamavro will not have that much tannin, but higher level examples, yeah, for sure. Um, so that would, I think, be a, a confusion. But I think, in general, um, um, I would expect a bit more, a bit more generous fruitiness to Zinamavro, especially on the mid palate. Um, but we'll talk about the uh, Italian confusions in just a sec when you guys have had a chance to taste. Um, Shangli asking about Barga, yeah, Barga from Portugal. Um, tannic aromatic variety uh, measuring not so much on fruit but on the kind of structural components and the savory flavor profile uh gosh could be shingly it's a good call um i've never sat down and done the tasting um it would be interesting to do that um savory dry wine perhaps you're also wondering about how much mid palate you're going to get perhaps that would also be similar yeah interesting interesting comparison uh, if you could find Barga, Barga is sometimes blended, so you, I guess you'd have to make sure that it was 100%. Um, okay, uh, 
Tufi Tarasi, um, 2011. Uh, good, nice to have a bit of age on that. Ripe black fruit, spice, incense, hints of feral, funky notes, violets, earth, leather, and cigar box beginning. Big structure, high, fresh acidity, high levels of grippy tannins felt on the gums. Full body, high alcohol, long length, savory, complex, layered finish, long bottle life ahead. Outstanding. Yeah, sounds fantastic, Tufi. Um, I mean, just high everything. Remember, we've seen in the previous two wines in the Barbera and the Montepulciano, Porciano, who almost have been stuck in the medium world, apart from the acidity, perhaps, but we seem to have broken through that. And now we're getting a lot of highs, at least in Tufi's example. Uh, Nupa, uh, floral, lifted red and black fruit, uh, balsamic, powerful muscular tannins and juicy acidity. So emphasis again on tannins and acidity, the structural components of the wine, but also on the aromatics, um, aromatic emphasis here. Um, a sunny uh, Tarasi, deep purple, um, pronounced intensity, violet, uh, black fruits, incense, lots of herbal, sage, rosemary, high tannins, firm and grainy, um, medium plus acidity and body and high alcohol, 14.5% with a savory finish. Overall, quite juicy, somewhere between Montepulciano and Barbera, but much more structure and tannin, yeah. Uh, outstanding quality. So also, in addition to the high levels, the increasing levels of everything, we're also getting higher levels of quality, I think, in terms of the complexity of the wine. Good. Um, amber, um, 2017 Alianico, black cherries, black olives with warm earth. Yeah, the earth note is quite consistent. Very brooding and inviting. Big tannins all over the gums, like a Bordeaux variety, but distinctly chalky. Chalky tannins, good. Very high, almost drooling acidity. Yeah, classic Italian combinations of high tannins of a grainy kind, chalky, grainy kind, uh, and high acidity. Classic Italian combination. Um, Amiel. Uh, 2017 Alianico del Vulture, exquisitely balanced plums, red and black with a hint of jamminess, carob, black bramble, fruit, high acidity, perfectly integrated with medium alcohol and a rich, not crunchy fruit. Yeah, rich, not crunchy. We're certainly away from the crunchy world now, We've gone further south, warmer, riper fruit, fine grained, medium plus tannins felt on the four gums and the tongue. Very pleasant impression on the dry finish, built out the tannins on the tongue. They combine with the acidity and fruit felt on the outer part of the tongue. So again, an emphasis on the structural uh, components here, the tannins and the acidity, which draw the attention towards the edge of the mouth, because of course, being a typical Italian variety, you feel the tannins on the gums around the edge of the mouth. Um, and you draw the focus away from the mid palate, the fruit on the tongue. I haven't heard much discussion so far about the fruit on the tongue, um, which to me makes sense. To me, the focus of this variety is much more about the uh, structural components of the wine felt around the edge. Um, and Amiel makes that point very well. Um, Shengli uh, Vulture 2015, medium garnet. Good, thank you for the color note. I've actually got a 2012 and mine is almost tawny color. So my guess is that it started out as a kind of pale ruby and just with the age, it's gone almost tawny color. So garnet, Shengli is going with, maybe I mean garnet rather than tawny. Yep, so pale color. Um, gainy, mushroom, mint, sanguine, good, good notes. Dried herbs, tart and just ripe red cherry, tomato leaf, tart blackberry, 13% alcohol only. Uh, high acidity, high fine grain tannins. So um the variety doesn't have to have high alcohol good note from shengli but all those things i was talking i was going on about in connection with the nero the untamed the wild character of the wine shengli captures really really well with those notes thank you shengli um sarah black cherry some red fruit quite dusty anise on the palate the fruit is quite sour but juicy high acidity high fine but firm tannin medium long finish 13% alcohol only, surprisingly refreshing. Yep, high acidity. Again, comes to the four. Philip, uh, Vulture, 
uh, dark ruby center, lighter at the rim, gamey, leathery notes on the nose, but not Brett. Tannins are big and chalky, raspberry notes with a slightly tart finish, nice, savory, herbal notes that come out as it sits on the palate. So the savory, um, the non-fruit notes emerge a bit more with time in the glass. Culture for Corin, uh, mid to deep ruby, roses, um, good, meaty, meaty notes, plum, dried herbs, searing acidity, high gritty tannins, 13.5% alcohol, long, earthy, leathery finish, delicious. So again, all these savory notes coming to the fore. Michelle, ripe, dry black fruit, um, balsamic, roasted herbs, persistent, a fine grainy tannins, lively acidity. Can sense fruit on the mid palate, but the tannins take away from it with a moderate finish. Um, and Shang Li say he really, Shang Li thinks that the wine is 14%, even though on the label it says 13%. So good figure. Um, okay, so let me see what I came up with. I think you guys really said it said it all. Um, Tarasi and Vulture, uh, moderate color. I mean, in some examples, saying it's a moderate color might be generous. This could be in the same vein as Nebbiolo and some Sangiovese is really not having that much color for a red variety. The aromatic style of the wine, um, earthy, incense, meaty, smoky, essentially anything slightly wild and savory and savage is going on in this wine. Full bodied, again, not full bodied in the sense of having an abundance of fruit. I don't think this is really a wine about fruit so much, um, but full bodied in the sense of having a powerful structure in the same way that Nebbiolo is full bodied, powerful structure. Well, it's a full mouth, a mouthful of wine, full bodied, powerful, high levels of slight, I'm going with slightly coarse, but I think the grainy, chalky spectrum is all totally fine. Uh, on the gums, I think we all agree on that. The perfumed finish, many of you mentioned the way that the flavors continue on the finish. The, my mention of perfumed finish is, is a reminder about the retronasal effect. After you've swallowed, the perfume almost seems to be enhanced. It just seems to hover in your palate. Uh, I love that. It's one of the great attractive features to me of aromatic reds. Alianico, Nebbiolo, Pinot Noir have that retronasal perfume finish. I love that. Um, the confusions, ask me about your confusions. Would you make those same confusion mistakes um, as the ones I'm listing? Do you have other ones that you might confuse this with? I mentioned Zinamavro. I'll come on to um, Nebbiolo in just a sec. Um, but Corin has, has um, offered some very uh, useful uh, notes. Thank you, Corin. So Corin is talking about the different regions for um, Alianico within Italy and some possible pointers to tell them apart. Um, so Ta Taurasi, Corin says, sour red cherry uh, or red rose. So emphasis on the red uh, fruits, the red spectrum. Um, Taburno, I don't know whether anyone had an Alianico del Taburno today, but Corin says look out for the leather and herb notes in that style. And the Vulture um, is, according to Corin, rich plum and highly mineral. Um, the mineral remark there in association with the Vulture reminds me to mention again, of course, the volcanic soils here. So I often look for a smoky note. Um, in wines that are grown on volcanic soils. To me, the incense aromas of Alianico capture that smoky sense. Such a characteristic thing. Um, but if any of you have never aged Alianico, um, please consider doing so, because if you think your wine is good when it's young, it doesn't take, we're not talking about decades here. Um, my 2012 is, well, oh, it's just wonderfully bacony and bacon fat and smoky and oh, it's just a beautiful wine and this was a uh, not a not an expensive example i was just able to find one with just a few years age so um please try um so sangiovese i think it's just a, a more untamed variety than sangiovese um so brunello as i said would be closest for the powerful structure but just a bit wilder all around for all the reasons that we've just described 
Nebbiolo, similar, yes, but at least with Nebbiolo, you get the emphasis on the, the structure rather than the fruit, which I think is similar here, but just a lot more going on in flavor dimensions, not in terms of complexity, and Nebbiolo is wonderfully complex, we all know that, but in terms of the, the weird funkiness, I think, with the Alianico, that you might not get with the sort of slightly better behaved um, Nebbiolo. Norello, I hope you'll have the opportunity to make your own comparison in just a sec. Um, two of you saying Sagrantino, most Terrasi I've tasted has a deep color uh, like Sagrantino. Um, Sagrantino, Sagrantino, so Umbria, so it comes from halfway between here and Tuscany, so it could be considered in geographical terms as a kind of cross. Sagrantino usually has is a real battle against the tannins in Sagrantino. Um, it can be a little bit like Sangiovese, just with more of everything. I think a deeper color, a bit more mid palate concentration of fruit, um, but really powerful tannins in Sagrantino. And sometimes with Sagrantino, I feel like the payoff you get for battling through those tannins isn't quite there. Whereas I think it is with the Alianico because of all the dish delicious flavors. Um, Sagrantino, I think, is more in flavor terms, sort of along Sangiovese lines, slightly wilder, but nowhere near this level of craziness. Corin, do you have any thoughts about Sagrantino? Not a variety I taste very often. Um, but a variety I struggle with a little bit, you know, $50, $60. Okay, so same price as good Brunello. But for less money, I can get Alianico, and I think that's where I'd rather spend my money, I must admit. But um, Sagrantino, it seems to me, takes a long time. Very dense, concentrated, powerful, structured wine. Um, and I, I guess I've yet to see uh, an aged example, which I'd rather buy than, say, Brunello for the same price. Um, Amber's saying, I'm really getting the perfume finish. The empty glass is also incredibly perfumed as well. And Corinne's saying, yeah, huge tannins on Sagrantino. I, to me, Sagrantino is out, is out of balance because the tannins are too big for the rest of the wine. Here, Alianico, yes, I get the fact there's a lot of tannins, like there is in Nebbiolo, but there's a lot of other stuff going on in the wine, which doesn't mean to me that it's so, so much about the tannins. Okay, we are running a little late, but I hope you will forgive me that for this, our last session. Um, as we move on to the final wine, and it will be interesting for us, to, I think, to compare um, these two more southern wines. So please do taste uh, your Norello Mascalese if you have one now. Um, Norello Mascalese, principally a Sicilian variety, um, grown in different parts of Sicily, but I think most people agree that the best expressions seem to come from the slopes of Mount Etna, um, where it really enjoys the volcanic soils. Um, we're talking about quite, uh, you know, difficult viticulture, expensive work in the vineyards, dry, hot climate. Um, no surprise that the best examples of these wines are expensive because of all those factors, but also because, in my opinion, this is a wonderful variety, which is rightly expensive and should be sought after and people should be prepared to pay for it. Um, so I apologize if this session was a bit expensive for you to, to source the wines for, but I mean, I still think going back to the Alianico that that could be a great wine. Um, for instance, the one I had was an Irpinia, another appellation, um, just a little wine, just like, like a little baby wine compared to uh, Vulture um, or Tarasi. And even that one was just so full of complexity and uh, good for aging. Um, and I think Norello, Norello, what are you paying for Norello? Probably cheapest would be $25 to $30. Good examples from great producers like Pasapiciaro. The entry level Pasapiciaro is now about 40 to 45 US dollars. And the single uh, site uh, wines are more like $65 plus, so expensive wines. Um, but I think, um, you've got a combination of place and variety, you know, in typical European fashion, um, which is a magical combination. And that's really what you're paying for. So anyway, I hope you managed to, to find a Norello. Um, it doesn't even have to be an expensive one, just one from Sicily. 
Um, and really great context now to come on to a Norello after our discussion in general of Italian reds we've had today, not just about the ones we've tasted, but all the other things we've mentioned in passing. Um, uh, I would like to draw out the emphasis again on perhaps Alianico being a wine more about the, you know, more about the structural components felt around the edge of the mouth or, or on the gums, the tannins, in a similar way to both Nebbiolo and Sangiovese, where you do not feel that the, 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 the focal point of the wine is the fruit felt on the tongue. That would be a characteristic, say, I think of Barbera or maybe a Valpolicella where there's generous fruit, easy, easy to find, easy to detect on the tongue. I think in these more structured varieties in Italy, there's not a lot of interest in the, in the mid palate um, of the wines. Um, but a lot of the energy and the focus of the wines, it comes around the edge where the tannins, uh, where the tannins are and on the finish in typical Italian fashion. And so just have that thought in mind. Um, when you're tasting the Rolla Mascalese as well, do you get more mid palates? We're in very southern Europe now, not just southern Italy, but southern Europe. Now, perhaps that warm climate will give you more mid palate, or is it behaving in the same mold as Alianico and Nebbiolo? Uh, what's the focal point of the wine? Um, I think too about the quality of the tannins. Uh, unsurprisingly, being in Italy, of course, we we've been experienced tannins again in the Rolla Mascalese, but are they attractive tannins, high quality tannins? Or are they too much? Are we being uh, off put here? Um, I really enjoy the aromatics of Alianico. Um, I love the fact that it's really an aromatic variety. I mean, w when we describe a red wine as an aromatic variety, or at least I do, I don't know whether anyone else ever does, but I think what I mean is not that varieties like Barbera aren't aromatic, of course they are, but just the focal point of the wine doesn't really seem to be the aromas. To me, an aromatic variety is one where so much of the attention is drawn to the aromas. And I think it's such a striking feature. For instance, the Alianico. My, my Alianico now smells almost like melting dark chocolate. Very funny, very funny, yeah. Uh, a very delicious aroma. Um, and so Nebbiolo would be another variety which I would call an aromatic variety for its emphasis on the aromas. Sangiovese, I don't know whether I'd go that far. Sangiovese, there's all the other elements are contributing to the wine as well. Um, okay, Sunny, thank you with our first note. Uh, pale Ruby, yep, yeah, great to comment on the color. Um, I think I would agree with Pale Ruby. We are yet again, I believe, tell me if you have an example that is different. But my example, again, is another Italian wine without much color. Um, pronounced intensity of fresh red cherry, strawberry, quite smoky. Uh, medium tannins on the gums, high acidity, lots of fruit on the palate, but very dry, savory finish. Could almost be confused with Pinot Noir, but with grippier tannin still behaving like northern Italy in the sense that the structure is the focal point. Good. Uh, really good notes. I love the suggestion about the Pinot Noir. Um, a very interesting comparison there, but also um, the comparison with Nebbiolo, um, the emphasis on the structure. Uh, and good notes there about the color, uh, red fruit character. Um, the truth here has got a Cornelison, a moderate color, intensely perfumed. Weird aromas. Well, it's Cornelison. Dried fruit, ripe black and red fruit too. Savory, animal hints, olives, high fresh acidity, medium plus levels of fine grains, almost velvety tannins. Full body, high alcohol, but keeping poise and elegance in a long length with a complex, endless finish. And Tufi says the beauty shines here. Yeah. Great, great note, really picking up on all the, the kind of weird features about this variety. Um, the emphasis on the perfume, the strange perfume, the high acidity, the high quality tannins, and the fantastic finish, Tupi is really emphasizing. Um, Amiel, uh, slate, slightly jammy, strawberries, raspberries, violets, high alcohol, dates and leather. So those are the savory notes, high acidity, 
fine grained meat and plus tannins, juicy fruit, uh, tannins and smoke on the finish, which is long and complex, just like Tufi said. Um, very good. Sarah, a pale ruby color, smoky dried cherry, medium plus very, very silky tannins. Good fruit concentration, but medium body, medium plus acidity, um, savory finish, really elegant. Sounds great. Um, I like the emphasis there on the silky quality of the tannins. Let me just take a look at mine. Yeah, the, the tannins are a fantastic quality. Um, they're quite powerful. I mean, actually very powerful, but they're so well fruit wrapped, which is not usually something I talk about in the context of Italian wines, but they're so juicy, the tannins themselves, that you don't notice them. You think they perhaps are less strong than they actually are. But you feel them on the finish as well. Um, very good. Shengli. Uh, Gracchi, Gracchi, fantastic wines. Gracchi, um, wonderful red, but rose is also one of the best roses, rosatos you can get from Italy. Um, by the way, Gracchi Rosato was the first wine I tasted after I sat the MW tasting exam. So I have good memories. Um, pale ruby, tart, red cherry, tomato, smoke, ash, baking spices, black olive, leather savory herbs just think about all those aromas and flavors going on at once medium fine tannins elevated acidity um fantastic and another one um pale ruby juicy red cherry rose red licorice thyme sanguine mushroom moderate body elevated smooth tannins elevated acidity with a long finish yeah great notes um so a lot of emphasis here on the quality of the tannins um high acidity um moderate to high alcohol 14 percent seems pretty much standard but also again as we saw with the alianico the complexity of the aromas and flavors here is, is really is really high um let's see what i came up with yes yes aromatic variety anyone get any smoky reduction um any sense that the aromas are a bit shut up um i often find a tiny hint of reduction on in these wines that are grown on these volcanic soils i think it goes hand in hand with smokiness smokiness can is i think a, a comment sometimes on reduction um, earthy herbal yep only medium bodied yeah again we're not in blockbuster territory in spite of being so far south so um you would think you might think, oh, look, this is going to be a really powerful wine. We're going to have more body and more concentration of the Ayanico. Not really true. It's a much more delicate variety, a kind of cross between Pinot Noir and Nebbiolo. Sweet red fruit flavors. Important point. Um, I think ultimately the sweet pro the profile of the fruit in this wine is sweet rather than savory. So we can have a conversation about whether nebbiolo is basically sweet red fruits or savory but in the case of sangiovese and in the case of alianico i'm definitely going to come down on the savory side but here we are very squarely in sweet tasting red fruit territory all of you have mentioned the red fruit but the sweetness of that red fruit is quite noticeable don't you think so if we're not getting the body from the southern origin we perhaps are at least getting the warm red fruited quality um, which I think is very nice. Interesting though that we don't, some of you are mentioning black fruits, but really red fruit seems to win out. Again, you might think that with the ripeness, you're gonna veer over as we usually do in ripeness from red to black fruits, but actually the variety seems to be really a, a variety which is based about red fruits. Powerful chalky tannins, maybe chalky, but if someone said silky, which is good. Um, I, I mean, I think the main point about the tannins, which I didn't really draw out enough here, is the way that they are just wrapped up in the fruit. Whatever texture word that you want to use, they are enveloped in that uh, red fruit, um, which is that, uh, you know, the Nebbiolo combination thing. Um, this powerful, this weird 
powerful structure, but somehow the fruit is delicate, but the fruit wraps up the structure. How does that work? I don't know. It's kind of a magic trick, but I think that is the, the, the wonderful thing about this variety. Um, and all of you have commented again on the finish. Uh, amber, um, red fruits, cherries, and savory pomegranate and spice with an intriguing, intriguing marzipan note. High tannins, but incredibly silky and Pinot Noir like, yeah. It's almost like a cross between a Pinot Noir and a Nebbiolo, isn't it? Such a weird wine, but I think a fantastic combination. I'm very happy with that combination for sure. Um, Amber says the power plus elegance makes me think of those well built male Russian ballet dancers. Beautiful wine. Um, yeah, good. Nice uh, comparison. Sarah saying, um, I tasted this next to some Pinot Noir. I found it very smoky and savory in comparison, but I can see it's sweeter than Nebbiolo. I think it's sweeter than Nebbiolo as well. I think the Nebbiolo is a red rather than a black fruited wine. Um, but Sarah making the case that the um, Pinot Noir could be sweeter tasting than this. Yeah, it could be. I think it's uh, wine by wine, but certainly mine is just <sighs> on the nose, it is. Um, more savory, isn't it, than I think Pinot Noir would be. But on the palate, I find it quite sweet. Um, but I think the herbal elements, which we've seen, I think, in every single wine we've looked at today, the herbal elements make it more savory on the nose. Uh, I agree with that. Um, certainly, if you're a new world Pinot Noir, then yeah, that's not going to be a comparison. Those wines will be sweet all the way through than, um, than this. Michelle, uh, Zinamavro. Um, Zinamavro, no, because it's just more rugged, dry, savory all the way through. It's much more of a sort of, I hate to say rustic, I don't mean that in a pejorative way, but it's less polished, it's a less polished wine. But, you know, as soon as we start using words like silky in connection with this variety, then we, we know that we're in a different world from cinema for it. Um, Pomar or Nuit Saint-Georges versus Norello. Possibly, but you see, this is where this is where Sarah. I think that if you're thinking about classic Burgundy, to me the fruit. I don't know. I was going to say the fruit is sweeter here than it would be in classic Burgundy. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I don't want to go to town on this. You know, I don't like flavors at the best of times. Um, but ultimately, we're in a in a world here where there's just more tan, more tan, and all the way through. Toothy's chosen the two most tannic appellations. Um, to try and make the confusion, which I acknowledge. Um, but I think you, 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 you guys know when you're in the presence of Pinot Noir. Uh, I don't think I need to tell you how to identify Pinot Noir. I think you get it. And I think even with the Pinot Noir-like comparisons we're making here, the tannins felt around the edge of the mouth, um, the sense of structure, the combination of Italian tannins and acidity, all of these things are going to put you in Italy, um, not in Pinot Noir land. Um, I think we're talking about Pinot Noir in the context of the high quality um, of the tannins and the delicate fruit and the aromatic style of the wine. But other elements of the wine will put you more squarely in this one. Um, okay, so um, a lot of fun, huh? Let's just make a few uh, final comments. Um, this um, the prize for anyone who knows where this vineyard is, by the way, I, I suspect no one's going to win it. Um, this is, in fact, uh, within the uh, uh, lagoon of Venice. And this is uh, an island in Venice. Um, I think it owns, this vineyard is owned by one of the Prosecco producers. I don't think, I mean, it certainly doesn't go to make Prosecco, it makes the, the local wine, whose name I've forgotten. Uh, it's a white, a white wine from indigenous local varieties. Uh, used to be a lot more of it grown um, in all the little islands around Venice, but that is Venice, you can see in the distance. Um, but uh, I was when I was there last summer, I had to go and see the vineyard, of course. Um, very small vineyards, but pretty cool, pretty cool place to find a vineyard. Um, I'm talking of which, um, so we all know that Italian red wine and Italian white wine is about indigenous varieties, but I mean, I guess, you know, doing a session like this reminds me not just of that fact, but of how good these varieties are, of how complex and interesting they can be. Um, I think Norello is just wonderful. I think Arianico is wonderful. You know, perhaps Barbera and Montepulciano are more sort of everyday varieties. Sure, fine. 
but that doesn't mean that on the right occasion they don't give you a lot of pleasure. Um, so wonderful indigenous varieties of Italy. Um, and the great thing I think about where we are right now in terms of winemaking um, is that all winemaking trends in the world, especially in Italy, they were going towards enabling transparency um, of the varieties of the places from which they come. So less oak, less extraction, less manipulation of the wine all the way through, just to try and encourage that purity of flavor of expression. So I think this is just a wonderful time to be drinking Italian wine. Um, and then I guess, you know, we can talk about things like tannins, we can talk about things like pale color, but ultimately I think the combination of acidity and the herbal quality that I think we found across all these wines today is the absolute Italian giveaway. Um, so do look out for those in that combination and then you won't confuse them, I don't think, for Pinot Noir or anything else like that. Okay, so I think that's all I have to say about uh, these four Italian reds, at least. I mean, we could do the session again with four totally different ones, not including Sangiovese and Nebbiolo, and it would be just as interesting. Um, so this was a kind of arbitrary choice, but I hope you've enjoyed this lineup. And I hope you've enjoyed this whole uh, series. Um, uh, certainly, I uh, always take the opportunity to drink, especially perhaps the lesser known European uh, wines, lesser known regions, um, because I think this can be the sources of unexpected pleasure, often at quite affordable uh, prices. Um, so wonderful to get the opportunity to do that. So I thank you if you're watching live for all your great comments you've made during the course of these webinars. Um, uh, it certainly makes my life a lot easier <laughs> when you're doing my work for me. So thank you for that. And uh, uh, I will see you uh, online again, I think, for more webinars uh, in, the, in the near future. Until then, thank you guys.